Do you like me? Of course I do, you old jerk. Really? Wow. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 kids show episodes that dealt with serious issues. It was a really bad scene. I didn't think it could get any worse. But boy, was I wrong. For this list, we'll be looking at shows primarily aimed at younger demographics that demonstrated just how mature they could be. Which kids show sticks with you as an adult? Let us know in the comments. Number 20, Inner Beauty, Lizzie McGuire. We remember Lizzie McGuire for the wacky hijinks, but this surprisingly grounded episode sticks with fans above all others. When Miranda sees a photo of herself, she's driven to lose weight. Maybe you're right, Gordo. Maybe I do eat too much. I never said you eat too much. Yeah, you did, yesterday. <laughs> and you guys eat a lot. That's it. I'm going on a diet. Lizzie and Gordo are beyond confused, and they only grow more concerned as Miranda starts skipping meals and nearly passes out. Miranda does have an eating disorder, but not in the way that she thinks. Her dangerous diet is rooted in stress and the pursuit of control. I guess eating is the only thing I have any control over. Like, all this other stuff just happens to me, but eating something I have a say in. That's not true. That's how it feels. While Miranda's dilemma is resolved in half-hour sitcom fashion, the episode gets to the center of anorexia and the need for an understanding support system. To an extent, it mirrored life behind the scenes, as Hilary Duff also struggled with body image as a teen. Number 19, And She Was Gone, as told by Ginger. While she was in seventh grade, Emily Kapneck wrote a play about a girl who takes her own life. Kapneck was subsequently required to visit the school psychologist's office on a daily basis. Although most of her teachers were concerned, the drama teacher, Ms. Zorsky, found the play creative, putting it on as a production. Since I do a lot of the writing for the show, there is some stuff we share in common, like Ginger keeps a journal and I kept a journal too. And Ginger's favorite teacher is named after my favorite teacher, Ms. Zorsky. Years later, the experience inspired an episode of this Nicktoon, in which a character named after Ms. Zorsky reads an alarming poem by Ginger. Ginger doesn't want to disappear like the girl in her poem. Upon opening up to others, though, Ginger finds that there is a little of herself in the character. Writing provides an outlet for Ginger to understand depression and how it affects us all. Number 18, I Remember You, Adventure Time. Adventure Time constantly crept up on us with its layered character development. At the beginning of the series, most folks write off the Ice King as bonkers. As we delve deeper into his backstory, we find that Ice King is not only a tragic figure, but he reflects real people living with Alzheimer's and bipolar disorder. You don't remember anything, do you, Simon? What, man? Why do you even come see me when you don't remember me? You don't even know who you are. Yes, I do. I am a lyricist. Nowhere is this better exemplified than in his jam session with Marceline. The vampire queen finds it hard to be around the Ice King, knowing that the father figure she once knew has lost his memories and grip on reality. Through the power of music, Ice King and Marceline find a way to reconnect. This magic keeps me alive, but it's making me crazy. And I need to save you, but who's going to save me? Please forgive me for whatever I do when I don't remember you. Ice King might not remember everything, but the love is still there. Number 17, Dances with Ignorance, Pepper Ann. Pepper Ann doesn't get as much attention as some other Disney shows, but it was ahead of the curve on many issues. Nowadays, it's not uncommon for kids' shows to tackle offensive stereotypes. Each of you will research one nationality of your family heritage, and then I want you to bust a hype presentation for the class. 
I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by the variety of ethnic spices we have in our very own little melting pot. In the late 90s, though, it was a bold subject for one Saturday morning. Discovering that she's 1 16th Navajo, Pepper Ann wishes to embrace her heritage. Alas, her knowledge is limited to grossly inaccurate depictions in movies and games, not to mention that crying Native American ad. There are even a few jabs at Disney's Pocahontas. You cannot hope to understand the special bond they share with my tribe. Unlike you two, we paint with all the colors of the wind. Although this could have backfired, the episode makes it clear that Pepper Ann is the ignorant one, which she learns upon offending a Navajo family. Pepper Ann commits to learning more about her background by listening. Number 16. Hey, Who Wants Pizza? Andy Mack. Andy Mack was revolutionary for several reasons, most notably marking the first Disney Channel show to include a gay character among the main cast. Granted, shows like Good Luck Charlie featured LGBTQ characters, but the network had never shined the spotlight on a young person coming out. Cyrus Goodman's story arc reaches a pivotal point in the season two premiere as he confesses to Buffy that he likes Jonah. I feel weird. Different. Iris, you've always been weird, but you're no different. Cyrus's journey continued to evolve throughout the series, culminating with him telling Jonah that he's gay, another first for the Disney Channel. Okay, cool. Creator Terry Minsky based Cyrus on some of her daughter's friends who realized they were gay in middle school. Through Cyrus, more LGBTQ kids can grow up knowing that they're not different. Number 15. Why Charlie Brown Why? Peanuts was always more adult than some gave it credit, with life's disappointing curveballs being a common theme. This Emmy-nominated special found the series at its most mature, delving into an issue no child should have to face. Look, I found myself last week and the bruises are still there. Look at all the bruises on my legs. You do have a lot of bruises. You sure bruise easily. I never used to. Alas, too many have no choice. Charles Schultz was no stranger to cancer, having lost his mother to the disease. It was a Stanford Children's Hospital nurse, Sylvia Cook, who encouraged Schultz to produce a project featuring young cancer patients. With input from the American Cancer Society, Schultz wrote a special revolving around Janice, a young girl with leukemia. I have cancer. Cancer? That sounds scary. How do they know that? I, 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 I don't understand. Well, they've done lots of tests on me. They found out that I have leukemia. Although it doesn't shy away from the cruel nature of cancer, the special is ultimately life-affirming. Janice proves resilient throughout treatment, finishing chemotherapy with hopeful results. Number 14. Jimmy – Static Shock This underappreciated DCAU won a Humanitas Prize for its season two finale, which is just as relevant now as when it first aired in 2002. Released only three years after the Columbine tragedy, the episode revolves around Jimmy Osgood, a young man who's been mistreated at school. Stop it! Stop it! I mean it! I mean it! Don't! Not cool, Nick. Give me a break, Hawkins. Coming across Jimmy's computer, Virgil realizes that he's taken his father's gun. Virgil deals with traditional comic book villains on a regular basis. Yet, few images in the series are more haunting than a scared, angry teen pointing a gun at his tormentor, accidentally shooting Richie amid the chaos. Okay, put it down. That's not funny. Lots of things aren't funny. Breaking my computer wasn't funny. Shoving me in the locker wasn't funny. Jimmy, you're right. I I'm sorry, man. No, you're not. Although thankfully nobody dies, Jimmy's actions have consequences. Not everyone learns a lesson, but Virgil will always be on the lookout to prevent something like this from happening again. Number 13. Mad Love – The New Batman Adventures Batman paved the way for shows such as Static Shock. With episodes like It's Never Too Late tackling drug use and redemption, the series felt as if it could take place in the real world. This even extended to over-the-top villains like the Joker and Harley Quinn. That's a real gasser, huh, Mr. J? I give the punchlines around here, 
Got it? Yes, sir. The older we get, the more eerily identifiable their toxic relationship becomes. Harley's devotion to Mr. J was fleshed out in the Eisner Award-winning comic Mad Love, which would be faithfully adapted to the screen. The story captures how a promising individual can have their world turned upside down by a manipulative love interest. You've forgotten what I told you a long time ago. One of the painful truths of comedy. You always take shots from folks who just don't get the joke. Even when someone finally says enough is enough, an empty gesture may be all it takes for the vicious cycle to repeat. Number 12. Appa's Lost Days Avatar The Last Airbender Taking place against the backdrop of war, we could include the entirety of Avatar The Last Airbender on this list. Since individual episodes are the focus here, however, we're singling out one of the show's saddest half-hours. Separated from Team Avatar, Flying Bison, Appa, is sold to a circus after being abducted. <laughs> Appa winds up at the mercy of a sadistic animal tamer, while much of the audience finds amusement in his suffering. Appa's Lost Days won a Genesis Award from the Humane Society for its depiction of how circuses have treated countless animals, a topic that's only gotten more attention since the initial airing. Even after Appa escapes, the lost animal endures a physically and emotionally exhausting journey while searching for Aang. Number 11. Faces of Hope, The Kids of Afghanistan, Nick News Nick News regularly approached real-world issues in a way that young audiences could understand without talking down to them. In the early 2000s, virtually every news program was reporting on the Taliban. However, only a select few focused on how the Taliban affects the children in Afghanistan. Girls in Afghanistan can't attend school. Here I can attend school and I can do whatever I please and I can play outside if I want to." In this Emmy-winning special, Linda Ellerbee provided a platform for several Afghan kids who left their home country after the Taliban rose to power. The episode explores why the Taliban and Osama bin Laden have solidified themselves as enemies of the U.S. At the same time, we see how the Taliban has made life unbearable for innocent people in Afghanistan. The Taliban have especially harsh laws concerning women and girls. By law, every woman must wear a burqa, a heavy cloak that covers her from head to toe. The special also emphasizes that many Muslims condemn the Taliban and just want to live in peace. Number 10. Alone at Sea – Steven Universe Behind its colorful, bubbly exterior, Steven Universe has gotten some pretty mature messages across to its audience. One of the most unsettling episodes finds Steven trying to comfort Lapis Lazuli, shortly after she escapes Jasper's clutches. I know you spent a really long time fused with Jasper at the bottom of the ocean, but you're not Malachite anymore, and water is a part of who you are. You can't let one bad experience take that away from you. Although their relationship was a recipe for disaster, Lapis reveals that she actually misses Jasper and feels that they belong together. You don't have to be with Jasper. That's not it. I I miss her. What? We refused for so long. When Jasper tracks Lapis down and asks her to fuse into Malachite, she's tempted to repeat a toxic cycle, but rejects it with Steven's support. No! What? What we had wasn't healthy. I never want to feel like I felt with you. Never again. So just go. Lapis! She said no! Through Lapis, the writers delivered a down-to-earth look at the nature of abusive relationships, as well as the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. Number 9. True Colors – That's So Raven This episode of That's So Raven explored Black History Month, but also delved into racial prejudices that still very much exist in 21st century America. I always knew about racism, but I never knew how much it could hurt. Yeah, Ray, that's intense. Raven applies for a job for which she is clearly the most qualified, only to see the Caucasian Chelsea land the position instead. Through a vision, Raven learns that the manager made her decision solely based on skin color. There's gotta be some reason why you didn't get that job. The truth is, I don't hire black people. Raven additionally finds that she's far from the first person of color who has faced job discrimination. Above all else, she learns that one person can make a huge difference in the fight for inclusion. As a result of this investigation, the manager, Chloe Hunter, 
has been fired, and the company has issued a public apology. See, you guys can make a difference. Number 8. Mel vs. The Future – Gortimer Gibbons' Life on Normal Street Overcome with denial, Mel refuses to cry over the sudden loss of her mother, and instead dedicates all of her energy towards building a time machine. I'm lost. It's hard to explain. Anyway, it's just a first step. To what? A time machine. I'm gonna fix this. Mel eventually crosses paths with her future self, who reveals that even after mastering time travel, she was still unable to save their mother. Regardless, Mel is willing to spend the rest of her life trying to undo this unspeakable tragedy. I don't know who you are, but if you were really me, you'd know that even if it took the rest of my life, saving mom would not be a waste of time. It isn't until Mel finally confides in her family and friends that she accepts her mother's passing. Even in the fantastical world of Normal Street, there are some harsh realities we can never escape. She can't be gone. I don't know. <laughs> Number 7. Helga on the Couch – Hey Arnold Why exactly is Helga so aggressive? Well, this episode reveals her father is likely a narcissist, her mother probably has an alcohol use disorder, and she's always lived in her overachieving sister's shadow. I don't want you blabbing to some school shrink. We Patakis don't talk about things. We sweep them under the rug. After punching a student, Helga is forced to meet with a child psychiatrist. Though reluctant, Helga soon places her trust in Dr. Bliss. We know Helga is troubled, but this episode really delved into her insecurities and emotional scars. I already told you that I've got a lame mom, a blowhard dad, and a perfect sister, so they make me mad. Big deal. It additionally showed us why she's so afraid to share her true feelings for Arnold. Dr. Bliss ultimately teaches Helga that she isn't alone, a message neglected children everywhere can take to heart. Number 6. A Formula for Hate Captain Planet and the Planeteers Taking a break from protecting the environment, Captain Planet tackled the HIV-AIDS crisis. Don't touch him, you could be next! AIDS? Todd Andrews? We meet Todd Andrews, a young HIV-positive athlete voiced by Neil Patrick Harris. As rumors about the disease spread, Todd and his mother, voiced by Elizabeth Taylor, become outcasts in the community. You were my pride and joy, and you let me down. No, no. The episode does, admittedly, simplify the hardships HIV AIDS patients face, but it was still incredibly risky for a children's animated series to take on this difficult subject matter, especially in the 90s. What the showrunners deliver is a well-meaning life lesson that both educates on AIDS and encourages acceptance. Get the facts! If Todd had any other disease, you'd be cheering him on! Right now, Todd needs your support! The power is yours! Number 5. The Great McGrady – Arthur Mrs. McGrady has been appearing on this series since Season 1. So it came as a massive blow to viewers when she was diagnosed with cancer. It's a side effect of the medicine, but her hair will grow back. See, the weeds keep popping up in Mrs. McGrady's garden, but the medicine's getting rid of them, right? Something like that. The way Arthur and his friends react to this news feels surprisingly relatable and authentic. Arthur and DW try to comfort McGrady, Muffy doesn't entirely understand what she's going through, and Francine is too afraid to visit her in person. Well, she's sick now. You know, some people don't get better. My grandfather died from cancer. Oh, you're being so negative. Unfortunately, Francine works up the courage following a talk with Lance Armstrong. I just wish I could do something. Being a good friend is doing something. This episode was co-written by Leah Ryan, who passed away from cancer before its airing. In her honor, McGrady was later gifted the first name Leah. Number 4. America's Kids Respond – Zoom And a lot of times countries fight because they think God is on – their God is on their side. And um, one big problem is what happens when two countries both think that God is on their side. It's like a religion war. The terrorist attack on September 11, 2001 has inspired many stories throughout the years, and Zoom was one of the first programs to address the tragedy. America's Kids Respond aired on PBS a mere 10 days after the World Trade Center collapsed. At a time when America was overwrought with grief, this special episode exemplified the importance of community and what we can all do to help. A year later, Zoom aired a follow-up special entitled America's Kids Remember. Even after a year, I still feel sad about what happened on those days. I think 9-11 kind of brought me into reality a little bit more. I don't know. I guess I'm just more aware of 
things going on in the world now. Reflecting on the aftermath of 9-11, the Zoomers showed us that the country may still be hurting, but it was also healing. We will never break. We will stand together through the dust of September. People hurt, hearts broken, but we survive. Number 3. Mother's Day – Rugrats Chucky Finster always stood out as the only Rugrat with a single parent. This Emmy-nominated episode addressed the absence of Chucky's mother and executed it in a subtle, honest way. Chucky only has vague memories of his mom, but still feels a strong connection with her. I wish I could remember stuff like that. Don't you remember ever having a mom? Nope. Sometimes I dream about having a mom, though. He tries filling the void by seeking out other maternal figures, but is ultimately drawn to a photo of the woman from his dreams. What's the matter, Chucky? I don't know. I thought it was a really pretty picture. I guess my dad doesn't like it, Tommy. Realizing that his son is old enough, Chaz begins to tell Chucky about his late mom. Although she passed away from a terminal illness, Chucky takes solace in knowing she'll always be with him in spirit. See guys? I do have a mom! She's right here in the flowers! And in the clouds! And in the grass, too! Number 2. Mr. Rogers Talks to Children and Adults About Violence – Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood Given the wholesome nature of his show, it's hard to imagine Fred Rogers talking about shootings. A year after John Lennon was assassinated, however, Rogers dedicated an episode to violence. There are people in the world who are so sick or so angry that they sometimes hurt other people, and they're usually the ones who end up in the news. With such a serious subject at its core, the special aired in the evening, and Rogers informed his viewers up front that youngsters shouldn't watch without a loving adult. So please get a grown-up that you love to watch this program with you because we're going to talk about some sad and scary things." As sad and scary as matters get, Rogers still offers a message of hope and peace. Unseen for nearly 35 years, the Fred Rogers Company released it to web in 2015, giving it a wider audience at a time when its topic remained a hot-button issue. You'll always find somebody who's trying to help. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Episode 1839, also known as Farewell Mr. Hooper, Sesame Street Since its debut in 1969, this series has taught kids everything from mathematics to nutrition. On occasion, Sesame Street has even veered into more serious territory, introducing characters with autism and divorced parents. In 1982, actor Will Lee, who played Mr. Hooper, died. Rather than recasting or avoiding the issue, the creators decided to use this opportunity to educate viewers on death. Big Bird, uh, don't you remember we told you? Uh, Mr. Hooper died. He he's dead. Oh yeah, I remember. Well, I'll give it to him when he comes back. Big Bird, Mr. Hooper's not coming back. The confusion and sadness Big Bird endures sincerely captures how many children cope with loss. This episode not only offers a loving tribute to Mr. Hooper, but also set the standard for all the other shows in this list. We can all be very happy that we had a chance to be with him and to know him yeah. and to love him a lot when he was here. <laughs> 